Okay, welcome back to Chapter 2, Laws, Ethics, and Issues, Part 3. In this section, we're going to be talking about the different components of an IEP and discussing those uh, individually. So, as I said before, there's a lot of different components to an IEP. And um, there's, there's actually over 200 laws represented in every IEP, although, of course, we don't go through every single one of those when we are looking in the textbooks. But um, we, we have um, different, you know, if you're, if you're looking at um, due process, there are actually several laws that deal with due process. And so that's how we can say that, you know, it's representative of a lot of different um, uh, laws that are a part of, of our nation's history. So the IEP has different components. One of the things that we've already talked about a little bit are present levels. Now, those are academic present levels, they can be functional present levels as well as um, emotional, which I haven't listed here. But academic, that's where, where we're talking about um, different aspects of math, reading, writing, um, uh, language. When, when a student has um, language goals, talking usually about a language impairment, we we have they have they have to have academic goals, but they also have to have functional goals. So we're going to be looking the, in in that kind of an IEP. You would look at how are they reading, or how are they responding to others. Now those are two different kinds of goals. You've got um, their reading ability, but also their functioning ability. So both of those have to be looked at. So um, you know do. Does the student seem to understand when you first give them instructions? And that would be just, um, you know, the, it, this isn't a goal that has to be corroborated in very many ways. Um, you do have to say, well, according to their reading, their their reading level, they have this is this is the point that they're reading at. But then also with functional goals, those are a little less um, clear sometimes, and you might write that as the student seems to understand when um, they are asked to do and they're asked to perform concrete activities but abstract activities are a little bit more difficult for them to understand what you want them to do so you have to really make uh, the activity clear to this student so then we might want to put on, a, on an IEP, we also need to always have on there that grade equivalent. And we can find that through running a Brigantz test. And this isn't a test that you have to um, have parent per um, permission for because it is an assessment that we do on reading scores. This is a teacher assessment <coughs> for um, for, that you would, if you do this for all of your students, then it's an activity of the classroom, looking at age equivalence. And on all tests, your, most tests will give you both the age equivalent and the grade equivalent. For example, um, the key math, which we're going to be using, gives an age um, equivalent as well as um, grade standard score. So you can have a standard score for each area. Um, and now you need to understand about CBAs and CBMs. To me, I use the term interchangeably. Now not everybody does. There, there, there are some mild differences. However, I look at them both and when I say CBM, I mean CBA and vice versa. But basically it's a curriculum based measurement or assessment. So if we, we're using curriculum-based measurement in order to do a curriculum-based assessment, they go hand in hand. And then we can also, we want to make sure that we write down what their classroom behavior is like. Because sometimes kids who are very frustrated 
in their academics have secondary behaviors that may look like it's related to an emotional disorder or um, misbehavior of some sort, but actually is frustration. So we need to be sure that we understand those two um, areas when we work with kids. And we need to have measurable long-term annual goals. Now, I think all of you took your um, methods course from me, whether it was 305 or 306. And you remember in the, in the goals, in the goals section, that, that um, the uh, objective section of the lesson plan. I was always telling you this has to be more measurable. Needs to be me, needs to be measurable. How do I know that this is you know um, not too vague? So when what I'm talking about is this, and this is a very important part of the IEP. Um, Sally will. complete um, 8 out of 10 math problems at the 5th grade level by the end of 2011-2012 school year. That is a measurable goal. You know exactly what you're talking about. Um, you, know, you know how many, 8 out of 10, math problems, okay, that, that pro probably could be worked on. Um, how about this one? Because that's not really um, clear enough. How about Sally will complete 8 out of 10 two-digit addition problems by the end of fifth, her, her fifth grade year? Okay, now we know she's in fifth grade this year. So we don't have to put that, that other 11-12 uh, date on there because we already know when this IEP ends. So we want to make sure that those goals are very, very solid and very clear. Now, progress monitoring. Um, there's, there, there's a specific page in, the, in every IEP that is going to have uh, progress monitoring on it. And basically you're going to just pick which monitoring level that they're at. Are they at a, a um, beginning? Um, and, and every IEP states it differently, which is difficult for me not having one in front of me from this area. So it would be, you know, is are, are they a beginning student in this area? Um, are, is this student um, becoming are um, familiar with the area? Are they are they at a mastery level? And you're just going to check off, and then you might want to write why you think they're at a mastery level. Now, alternative assessments, you're going to have to describe why they need an alternative assessment, and what kind of benchmarks or short short term objectives you're going to be using for those assessments. Now, we also need to go back and look at least restrictive environment again. You're going to have to have a statement in there about how the child's disability affects their involvement and progress in the general education curriculum. Um, so it might read, um, Sally has difficulty managing in a general education the in, classroom when the curriculum is not modified for her learning disability. She has a lot of difficulty being able to read and keep up with the other kids. So she needs accommodations in order to help her understand the material at the same rate as her non-disabled peers. Then we want to think about general education participation because that's where we're going. We need to have a statement of participation on how they're going to participate in statewide assessments. Now, if participation in the whole classroom, all 20, 30 kids that are in there, is not appropriate for Sally, then we're going to have to have another plan. 
So we might say, you know, Sally needs um, small, uh, a, a small test group, a smaller group, small group testing. So we're going to put her in a three to five group uh, child group, and then on top of that, there, there's going to be a, a, a teacher who's going to manage that small group of testing. Now they're going to be tested at the same rate, but they'll have extra time, and it'll be in a smaller group. Because usually when you put small group testing, you also put extra time, because it's generally understood that the two go together. Um, accommodations that are permitted. This is uh, the, some of the accommodations that you might have for statewide assessments. Now, if you're using it for statewide assessments, it's also assumed that you're going to be using this on a regular basis because the federal government several years ago made a point that if they were not using it in day-to-day -day testing situations, there was no reason for them to need it on the statewide test. So you had to be able to show where you had monitored that little Susie on using small group with extended time on her test arrangements on a regular daily base. So it also goes in there for daily and general accommodations because that way we can show where she really does need this accommodation. Then we also have to make sure that we have the service dates. Now, an, an interesting thing about this is we don't, if we have the, the IEP on August 31st, we don't write down the beginning date of August 31st. The beginning date is September 1st. We always go to the next day and it ends one day from the date of the IEP. You also need to put down um, where the location of the services are going to be held. Now generally we put down um, we might put down general education. We could put down um, resource room. We might put combination services. Combination is a very good way to go because that means that the, the gen ed teacher can get services for monitor. You can also, um, the, the special ed teacher can work in the gen ed classroom or in the resource classroom. So there's two different spaces for them to be able to work in. And now say you have speech and language services. Now the speech and language pathologist may prefer to do all of their services in their office one-on-one -on -one or in small group, but they're going to put that down. Um, the duration of the services. So say Sa Susie needs um, 30 minutes per week of, of um, speech and language. Then the speech and language pathologist is going to put down, um, you know, Jane Moore will provide 30 minutes worth of services um, three times per month. Now we say three times per month instead of four times per month just in case something happens and we can still keep it caught up. The, the reason for doing this is we have holidays and things like that that come around but on top of that we can go over our services we can never go under so um, if, if there if we know that that child is going to get um, for is going to need services four times a week we need to put down three, 30 minutes at four times a week but we also need to be able to um, have made a note of that. So every time you see that child, you need to make a note in a log so that you can show and prove that you saw that child and that you were working with them. Now, other considerations of the IEP team. You need to look at the strengths and needs of the child. An IEP should be written from a strength-based perspective not a weakness-based perspective. Not what do they constantly need, but how can we build up those strengths in order to shore up the weaknesses that they have. And we need to do that in academic, developmental, and functional areas. 
we also need to know what the concerns of the parents are and we have a paper for that too we have a sheet and um, it, we, we, the, the, it starts out asking what the parents hopes and dreams for the child is because we want to keep this as positive as possible because sometimes IEPs are very stressful and we want to keep it as upbeat as we can because it really does help for parents to be more accepting and for teachers to be more accepting of what the parents are doing. So we want to be able to work together. So we need to know what those concerns are. We need to know what the hopes and dreams are. We need, when, when it's an assessment IEP, that is when it's an IEP being held because assessment was completed, we have to have the results there. So you're going to have a space for whoever completed the assessment they're going to have their own page and uh, they're going to have to fill out their paperwork. You need to look at behavioral considerations. Is there any limited English proficiency? Are they blind or visually impaired? Do they need specific services? Do they need assistive technology? Are there any communications needs? And actually these four right here is all taken care of on one um, one page generally speaking and in the IEPs because it's basically one page you just have to read the whole page make sure that you you mark the right things on there and so it's it's you know do they need assistive technology in any way do they have any communication needs is uh, is Susie blind or does she have or she have any visual impairments or hearing impairments and so this you know it's really very cut and dried now who has to be part of an IEP team evaluation. You need the parents, the regular education teacher, the special education teacher, because actually the special ed teacher is probably going to be helping with certain aspects of the testing, which is why you need to know about some of the different types of testing that we do. Um, you have to have your LEA representative so you have to have somebody from the school district who can sign off on whatever they decide to do for the child or with the child. You have to have someone who can interpret the evaluation results. That is, generally speaking, the person who wrote the report and did the assessment. Unless they are not available. Now there have been times when um, I've been asked to go to IEP meetings and present a report that I had nothing to do with because the psychologist who did complete it was unavailable, they were no longer in the district, or they um, were double booked that day. And so there's, there are times when someone else may be interpreting that, those results. And then anybody else who, want, who has knowledge of the child or who, who, or who has been asked to attend, now that can be from the school district side. That can be from the parent side. I've been in parent meetings. I've been in, in IEP meetings where we've had the parent, the child, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, one or one or two um, other aunts and uncles, maybe an older brother or sister who could inter who could uh, translate for you. So you might have quite a few people in there. All of them have an equal vote, and when it's appropriate the child with a disability. I've had children as young as six want to attend, so yes, they attended. And then I've had children or adolescents as old as 17 who chose not to attend, and you can't really enforce it. But once they become 18, they are then in the stead of the parent. They are their own parent, so they have to attend. Now, what kinds of what kinds of data needs do we have in an evaluation? As part of an initial or a reevaluation process, every whether it's initial or evaluation at any time during the year, we may decide to review existing data, which I do hope happens because it's something we should constantly be doing. Now, this doesn't necessarily require formal testing, but maybe just a review of their progress. And actually, you should be reviewing their progress on a constant basis. You should know that IEP.
um, you should know that IEP backwards and forwards for all of your students so that you know exactly what it is that they need and, and how they are progressing. You can do this without a formal meeting. You just need to know what, what you need. A CBM, you can do that at any time during the year because that is a normal um, classroom activity. And it has been seen and proven to be a normal classroom activity in the research. Parents may also request additional assessments. Um, and anyone on the IEP team can request this, not just the parents, but the classroom teacher the special education teacher, um, ad administrators, anyone who is involved with that child can ask for a new IEP or ask for new assessments. Now it's up to the IEP committee to actually decide whether or not a new assessment is valid. Now remember that if additional testing is requested, the testing must take place before decisions are made about their services. Now when we think about evaluating students with LD, this is a learning disability, we need to remember how um, the, the different types of models that have been used. Now before 2004, we used what we called a severe discrepancy model. Now, what that has to do with, and we'll be looking more at this in, in Chapter 3, is that um, you have, it, it was called the wait and fail model. So they had to be at least two standard deviations behind before we were able to say that they had a learning disability. Now, after 2004 IDEA, we now have guidelines on how to diagnose a disability using early intervention, using different types of research-based practices, and response to, dis to intervention. Now, if you remember back to last semester or whenever you took 305 or 306 from me, um, response to intervention, we have three tiers. And in Tier 1, that's where you have the majority of your students. That's your 80% that tend to um, kind of go along with the general curriculum at a normal pace. Then you have Tier 2. In Tier 2, these are the kids who are having some problems being able to keep up with that general curriculum. And so they need some, some interventions, albeit they may not be um, intensive. Tier 3, those are the intensive interventions, but they're still not in special education. If they are not progressing or showing some progress at the Tier 3 level, that's when we go ahead and, and do some testing because we know that we've, we've got the data that we've, we've been um, doing all of the interventions that we're supposed to be doing, however, they're still not functioning uh, quite as well as they need to be. And so this is really the contemporary assessment model. Now we also need to remember that ADD is not a category. It falls into other health impaired because it's something that is typically handled by a physician. So students with ADD who require special ed services sometimes receive them in different ways. They might receive them, um, they might qualify as having a learning disability. Now if they truly have ADHD, and, but they don't really have LD, we should, not be tr we should not be servicing them there. They should be serviced under ADD because then they're going to get the services that they truly need and we're not going to constantly have to be figuring it out. Um, sometimes they're under um, ED or behavioral disabilities. Um, and that is very uh, difficult to deal with as well because you have to be able to pull out is it an emotional disorder or is it an attentional disorder? And it, an attentional disorder that is creating so much frustration that you're only seeing behaviors 
the best place for a student to receive them is under other health impairments because then it is very, very clear as to what the problem is and how to deal with it. If students with ADD don't qualify, say they are making C's in all of their classes, in all or more than, they're making at least a C in, in, um, in all of their classes, that is, they are not making any D's or F's in any classes then they may qualify for it with a 504 plan. If you remember in your text, it talks about the um, Americans with Disabilities Section 504. And this is where, um, it, this is a provision to take care of students in the, in the classroom to make sure that they are not um, treated unfairly due to their behaviors, due to their attention deficit. A disorder. But all students must un undergo a comprehensive evaluation. And that doesn't mean that the, um, that the multidisciplinary team is going to give them a, a test and say, okay, they have ADHD. You have to work with the doctor as well. And um, that uh, final um, diagnosis of ADHD comes from the doctor. However, it is the IEP or the evaluation team that determines if they actually qualify for services. Now, um, IEP team attendance. Typically, everybody should come. Um, attendance isn't necessary all of the time. If it's agreed upon by the parent and the, lo and, and the school, that somebody's attendance isn't necessary, then they may be dis they, they may be um, able to miss the meeting. Members can be excused if they either have in writing um, the reason for them to be excused, but they but the parent always has to sign off on it. Then there's a form for that. Um, and so whenever somebody's not going to attend or they have to leave early, there's a form for that. 